Good evening. Good evening. You can say it back, it's okay. How's everybody doing, you good? Good. Um, my name is Don Soy, I'm the Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs and the University's Chief Diversity Officer, and I'd like to thank you for coming out and braving this cold weather um, tonight. Um, so give yourselves a round of applause for being here, all right? And so tonight we have a very special event, a um, very special talk um, that we're going to be presenting to you today. And so our president, Dr. Julie Olian, is going to be interviewing at the end of this lecture um, our guest speaker today, and she's gonna have and lead a conversation and then we'll open it up um, to all of you. And so one of the ways in which you can ask your questions, we'll have a roving mic that will be going around the audience and we'll also have um, Slido where you can do it through hashtag Blair Taylor. So again, I'd just like to thank all of you for being here. Um, I'm pleased to have the honor of announcing tonight's speaker. Um, he has spent the day um, here on campus sharing insights with our students, our faculty and staff, and our community leaders. And I'm especially grateful to him for being um, so incredibly generous with his time, and so we'd like to say thank you. Um, you will discover shortly what some of us already know that Blair Taylor is a dynamic, enthusiastic, and highly motivated speaker and presenter. He truly believes that we can change the world and make it a better place, and we need a dose of that right now. So I'd like to give you a little bit of background on Blair's experience and how he comes to us today. Dr. Olian first met Blair when he was the trailblazing CEO of the Urban League of Los Angeles, where he was involved in transforming neighborhoods and communities that were hungry for economic opportunity. He is widely credited for transforming the agency through innovative nation-leading community-involved initiatives and programs such as the Neighborhoods at Work. Perhaps he'll tell us a little bit more about that later. When he moved to a much larger stage to Starbucks, how many of you have heard of Starbucks? Right, a Starbucks, a $79 billion company, he became a member of the Starbucks Global Leadership Team where he led the company's corporate social responsibility and government affairs functions, while also serving as the executive vice president of Starbucks Global Human Resources, where he had a direct reporting staff of more than 500 people. Even more impressive are the initiatives he launched while at Starbucks, the College Achievement Plan, Solution Cities, Opportunity Youth Hiring Initiatives, and the Starbucks Veteran Hiring Initiative. Blair also created the, brown, the groundbreaking agreement between Starbucks and Arizona State University, which enables any of its more than 250,000 employees to complete a bachelor's degree online, and that's very remarkable. He was a founding member of the Executive Oversight Committee, member of the 100,000 Opportunity Initiative, a coalition of more than 50 companies who hire more than 200,000 disengaged youth. All of his successes and his impact did not go unnoticed by then President Barack Obama. He tapped Blair to lead the My Brother's Keeper Alliance, a nonprofit launched by President Obama to advance communities of color broadly, and more specifically, boys and men of color. Blair has private sector experience beyond Starbucks, of course, which was part of the foundational groundwork for his subsequent successes. He was the president and CEO of a private retail franchising company that focused on low-income communities in the United States and the Caribbean, and he had more than eight years of leadership with Pepsi and the IBM Corporation in sales and brand marketing. He's a graduate of Amherst College in economics and a former trustee of that institution as well, and a UC Anderson grad where he earned his MBA in entrepreneurship and marketing. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Mr. Blair Taylor. Good evening. Now listen, I came through snow and sleet and three degree temperatures, flew all night, ran through, ran up here from New York City in my jogging suit. I need a better good evening than that. Let me try it again. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, thank you. Well, first of all, uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank uh, all of the folks that I've met at this incredible University. It's my first time on the campus, and I've been on a lot of university campuses over the years, and you guys have energy. You've got a great group of students. You've got incredible faculty, um, and it has just been a pleasure for me to be here. So thank you for welcoming me the way you did today. 
Um, I also have to say a special shout out to my dear friend Judy, who I love dearly. She knows this. Um, but I'm mad at you guys. I'm mad because you stole Judy from the West Coast <laughs> and brought her on out here. So I, your, our loss is your gain. Judy is fantastic. Thank you for inviting me. Congratulations on your new role. You guys have an incredible 21st century leader. Just trust me, you do, and you have great things ahead of you, not just from what I've seen with Judy, but from what I've seen with the entire faculty and staff that I've met today, and most importantly, with the students. Uh, Don, thank you for that introduction, man. I appreciate that. Um, I will tell you that uh, sometimes you hear about all these things that you've done in your life, and you go, I don't remember doing that, but that's a, I'm glad he's got it written down. So, you know, sometimes you have a tough time remembering all the things that you've done. I'm reminded of a story uh, of the two old men who were sitting on a park bench, uh, speaking of not being able to remember things, and one guy says to the other, he says, hey, uh, guess, can you guess my age? The other guy says, I can if, if you take your shirt off. The first guy looks at him and says, I can't take my shirt off. We're in public. We're in a park. I can't take my shirt off. He says, you take your shirt off or I won't be able to guess your age. So the first guy says, all right, takes off his shirt and says, guess my age. He says, well, I can, but you've got to take your pants off and jump up and down on one leg. The first guy looks at him and says, man, are you crazy? I'll get arrested. I'll be naked out here jumping up and down on one leg, totally naked. He says, Look, if you want me to guess your age, you got to do this. So the first guy reluctantly says, all right, takes off his shirt, takes off his pants. He's jumping up and down on one leg. He says, now guess my age. Second guy says, you're 95 years old. The first guy says, man, that's incredible. How'd you guess that? It's unbelievable. How did you figure that out? The second guy says, ah, you told me yesterday. <laughs> so... I forget some things, but forgive me for it. I'm excited to be here. I'm engaged with you guys, and I think this couldn't be a more important time for us to have a discussion about where we are, not just with diversity, but with a whole bunch of things for you in the future. And I'm gonna do something that I'm not good at. I'm gonna be brief, okay? Um, I put away my three-hour presentation, and I tried to snap it down to a crisp 30-minute presentation. So the clock is starting. I, I, I'm going to try to stick to that because otherwise somebody's going to give me the hook and pull me off the stage. But I want to start by just letting you guys know something. And this is for, you know, the old folks in the audience like me and the young folks alike. You are living through, we are living through one of the most important eras in the history of America right now. One of the most critical eras in the history of this nation you're living through. Now, why is that important? Because first of all, often people live through critical eras and they don't know that they live through it. You know, some folk lived through the, most, the previous most important eras in the United States and look back and said, I didn't know that was that important when I was going through it, right? And then 30 years later, they're like, oh, yeah, I guess that civil rights thing was kind of important at the time, right? So do, we don't want you to sleep through this era. So the first thing is, you got to acknowledge the error and how important it is. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. The second thing is, I don't want you to be discouraged by this era. I don't want you to be paralyzed by what's happening around you. Because let's face it, there's a lot of tumult and turmoil. And there's a lot of things to get angry about and depressed about. And you turn on the news and it's one person battling the next person, battling the next person. And i got to tell you, every now and then you just want to turn the whole thing off and be like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk to anybody. It's too much, it's circuit overload, right? And sometimes you think this is the most challenging era in the history of America, but it's not. Let me read something to you and ask you when you think this was written. Racial unrest with police and communities deadlocked in cities all across the nation. Global superpowers aggressively jockeying for position on the world stage in a dangerous nuclear world. Democrats veering further to the left and Republicans veering further to the right as a new conservative Republican president is ushered in, pledging to restore law and order and greatness to an increasingly fractured nation. America's ethnic races are retreating from the prospect of interracial communication to the comfort, context, and echo chambers of their own communities and their own peers. Media outlets are sounding the alarm loudly 
and relentlessly from both the left and the right, almost at an hysterical pitch, dividing citizens, dividing cities. Cities are breaking out in protests over America's wage and income inequalities. Does that sound a little familiar to you guys? In terms of some of the things that we've seen happening in the United States over the last couple of years with outbreaks in cities like Baltimore and New York and other places, with the divisiveness that we hear in our media. That was 1968. And I have to tell you something, if you go back and look at the year 1968, and you look what happened in the year 1968, you'll see that America had much more problems in 1968 than it has now. That was the year that Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And a few weeks later, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. And American cities were literally being burned to the ground. There were riots in the streets. There were outbreaks. And people were wondering if the democracy of this nation would survive. And I say that because of all the things that we're going through today, the context is important. Understanding history is important. Understanding as leaders, which we all are in this room, that we've been through worse before should embolden us to understand we will get through this as well. And so I want to spend a little bit of time because I'm a pragmatic leader. I want to spend just a couple of seconds understanding and thinking about some of the issues that you all, especially the young people in this room, or we all, when I include those who are over 45 in the room, of which I have to raise my hand, um, are going to be faced with in the next couple of decades. So a diverse world of opportunity. So who knows anything about the national debt? Anybody in here? Some economics majors? Come on, raise your hands. Who's, who's an economics major in here? Anybody? No economics majors in the room or bashful economics majors in the room. So let me tell you about the national debt. The national debt, by the way, this was about a week ago. The national debt is going up at $1 million per minute. $1 million per minute. The national debt now sits at over, or just under, I think it's actually now over, $22 trillion, because this is a little bit old. Every minute it goes up by a $1 million. If you look at the column to the right, the debt per taxpayer in the U.S., this is just government debt, the debt per taxpayer is $179,000. The debt per citizen is almost $67,000. That means I walked up to my 12-year-old boy, I said, son, you got 67000 on you? He looked at me like, no, dad, I was like, you better figure out how to get it, right? $67,000 per citizen. It's unbelievable. Here's the problem. Somebody's got to pay that back. Right? Somebody's got to pay that back. If you look at total U.S. debt, total U.S. debt means not just the debt from government, the debt from business, the debt from individuals, you roll that up, it's $72 trillion. If you zoom out to the globe right now, global debt, this is, these are all-time highs, by the way, never anything like, the global debt right now is approaching $300 trillion now. Why is that important? Because somebody's got to figure out solutions to pay that back. I said this earlier today, I'll say it again here. My generation screwed up, okay? We left some things that have to be cleaned up, and this is one of them, right? This is a big issue that's going to cr require creative, out-of-the-box thinking, which I'm going to come back to in a second. So what else is going on? Well, look. Somebody in the audience is like, man, this guy's kind of depressing so far, man. I mean, is there going to be any upside in this where we start feeling good? We'll come to that, all right? But first, I want to take you down through the valley for a minute. We have intergenerational systemic issues in this country. There are issues that revolve around the debt. There are issues that revolve around the environment. There are issues that revolve around inequality. These are issues that are a threat to the very basics of democracy. Now, I, I believe in this country. I've fought for this country over the years that I've been alive. But make no mistake about it, we don't have to exist as a nation. Like we are, these are existential threats to the country, and they need to be addressed and resolved. OK, so let me go back. Um, we talked about issues of race and inequality. Um, the federal government today is broken. 
Federal government's broken. Tell you a quick story. I was in Congress a few years ago when I was, when I was with a board of trustees at Amherst, where I went undergrad. We're walking through the halls of Congress with a guy who'd been in Congress since 1962. He was a historian. Guy's about 87 years old. And he's walking with us through the halls of Congress, and 17 trustees are behind him. And I'm up front, and I walk up to the guy, and I say, hey, let me ask you a question. What's the difference between Congress today and Congress back in 1962? That was the Kennedy administration. John F. Kennedy was president. This guy was in Congress, okay? He started going, hold it, hold it, everybody stop, stop. He called up the group. He said, this guy asked me a question he wants to answer. It's a great question. I want to answer it. He said, this guy asked me, what's the difference between Congress today and Congress in the 1960s? And he went on to explain that in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, into the early 80s, Congress people would argue with each other, veins bulging out of the neck. You'd see a Republican and a Democrat in the corner pointing fingers at each other. He said, but then after they were done with that, they'd go out and order a steak and write a piece of legislation. They get something done. They would do their jobs. He said, if you fast forward to today, the Congress people in the US Congress pass each other in the hallway and don't even say hello. The civility has deteriorated to such an extent our Congress people aren't greeting each other in the hallway. Now, why is that important? Because our system of government necessarily requires compromise and communication and collaboration. It grinds to a halt to wit the government shutdown when we don't talk to each other. And yet, we have people passing each other in the hallway. So the federal government is not working as it should. The world is rapidly accelerating. I'm in China a few years ago, and I went out to a mart. I'm passing by the table. And this is, this is a true story. I'm passing by the table, and the guy comes running out. He says, you want to buy a suit? And he had all this beautiful fabric. I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not buying a suit. I got enough suits in the closet. He's like, how much will you pay for the suit? I said, no, I'm not buying a suit, sir. I'm, I'm good. I was just looking at your stuff. It's really nice. Got great quality fabric here. He said, $250. I said, you're going to sell me a custom-made suit for $250? He's like, $250. I said, that's an incredible price. I can't pay it. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to buy a suit. He started bidding against himself. $225, $200. He got down to $180. Bucks. I said, you're going to design a custom-made suit out of this Super 150 fabric for $180? Bucks? He said, yeah. I said, look, I know I'm crazy. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a silly American who's over here in China. Um, but for the sake of international relations, I'm going to pay for that suit. How much do I have to give you? He said, give me half now. Give me half when I deliver the suit. I said, OK. I gave the guy 90 bucks. Now I walked away. I'm like, I'm the stupidest guy who ever lived. I'll never see that money again. It's over. What a dumb idea. He said, I'll deliver the suit to your hotel tonight before midnight. We'll do the final fitting, and then I'll come back with the suit. The problem was, it was 9 p.m. at night. This guy was going to deliver a, a custom-made suit to my hotel in under three hours. Five minutes to 12, my phone rings. I'm in the lobby. He comes up. He has this beautiful custom-made suit. He says, all I got to do is put the buttons on. It's five minutes to 7 in the morning. Phone rings again. He comes up with the suit. I give him the other $90, and my jaw is just wide open. Why? Because that's the competition for us in the new millennium. That's what we're fighting against. When you see Amazon and other companies trying to react, that's what they're reacting to. That's what you guys are going to be competing against. The world is accelerating, and they're intent upon beating us at our own game, right? Which means we got to think more innovatively and more creatively. Um, I love the nonprofit sector. I worked in the nonprofit sector. I've run organizations in the nonprofit sector. The nonprofit sector cannot scale very effectively to solve the problems that we face, which means we got to think of other ways of solving the problem. And then business is willing. Business has some great abilities. Business is untapped in a lot of ways. But business needs more expertise and more tools. So our era is filled with opportunity. But we got to be bold. We got to think outside the box. We got to think about collaborations and relationships that maybe we never thought about before. And we've got to activate those. And it's incumbent upon all of us, but especially upon our young people, to think about this differently. So to unlock the power of our era, because there's power in this era. And this isn't a depressing talk. This is a talk about how do you unlock the power of the most important era in the history of the country, which is what we're living through. We've got to put our energy against the biggest issues, right? 
So I, I, how do we collectively focus against those problems that represent existential threats to the country and the nation? We've got to move with optimistic urgency. We can't sit around and wait. We can't shut down the government for four or five, six weeks. We can't afford to do that, right? We've got to innovate. We've got to collaborate. And we've got to shift old paradigms. So with that as a backdrop, I want to suggest to you that we have untapped one of our greatest assets, which is our diversity. We have not effectively tapped into that. I won't say we, won't, we don't have tapped it, we have not tapped into it at all. I say we have not maximized our effort in tapping into diversity. And I want to make what I call, which I do with businesses all the time, I make the business case for diversity. Now you could say, well, diversity is just the right thing to do. You should have people from all ethnicities, backgrounds, races, creeds, colors in the room. Yeah, I, I believe that's right. It's the right thing to do. But there's a strong and compelling business case for diversity. And if the future leaders who are in this room should sit up and take note about that business case because it can change the course of your organization. So for companies, McKinsey did a study, 33% of the companies that have a diverse workforce have 33% more likely to have higher financial returns. They're better able to win top talent in the marketplace. It means they're more, makes them more competitive and more successful. Their employee satisfaction goes up. Their innovation goes up. And it turns out that racial diversity has a greater impact on all these things than gender diversity. And it's not to say that gender diversity is unimportant, but if you look at how we focused on gender diversity versus racial diversity, we've made more progress in gender diversity, and yet it turns out that racial diversity actually moves the needle further for these things. Harder, but it moves the needle further. So a quote uh, put in a magazine by Margaret Neal and Stanford, the worst kind of group for an organization that wants to be innovative and creative is one in which everyone is alike and gets along too well. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I married my wife, who's been my wife for 22 years. Um, Bridget, if you're out there watching, uh, hey, honey, you're the greatest. So I just had to get that little plug in because she really is. But I married my wife, and my wife is totally different than I am. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a forest person who sees the big vision and goes after the big North Star and sets that table. My wife is a tree person who sees the detail and zeroes in on the detail of things. She's an attorney and she was excellent as a partner in a law firm. She's retired now, but she's a partner in a law firm. She was excellent and she sees the detail. And when I first met my wife, I was like, I don't know if we're gonna get along because you know, I think this way and you think that way and you're too detailed, granular and all. And it's not that I can't do the details. That's just not my forte. She can do the big picture. That's not her forte. But guess what? When you combine the two of us together, I saw things that she couldn't see, and she sees things that I can't see. It's imagine two people with their backs up against each other, and one's looking this way, and the other one's looking that way. There are people who would have crept up on us that she saw that I would never see, right? That's a form of diversity. It's diversity in two different ways of being and thinking. And diverse groups can anticipate conflict. In other words, when you bring a group of people together from different ethnic backgrounds, different persuasions, different walks of life, that group tends to think like, well, we're going to have some conflict in here. And what's interesting is they actually prepare themselves for that conflict, and in so doing, they're actually better prepared for other conflicts when they come along. It's as if they've sort of previewed the notion of, of conflict in a group, right? And greater diversity also yields better outcomes versus tokenism. What does that mean? That means if your idea or my idea of diversity is I'm just going to put one woman in the room with 42 men, that doesn't yield the same outcomes, right? You have to really think about how do I not ostracize somebody and put them in the position of being that only one in the room. And I'm going to return to that in a couple of seconds. So diversity is our greatest asset, and yet 97% of senior teams in the U.S. do not reflect ethnic diversity? Are you kidding me? How's that possible, right? Gender diversity still has enormous gaps out there, both in the business world and in other parts of society. Communities across our country are highly segregated in the year 2019. And I would argue that part of it at least 
And I'm not saying this is the whole answer, but part of it at least stems from a lack of empathy, a lack of an ability to actually empathize with our fellow man, and therefore a lack of understanding. Can we show the video clip? I don't know where Carla is. Carla, are you in the room still? You guys ready? If we can do it, I wanna show you a, a quick video clip. And, and as, as they get this ready, I wanna ask you a question. There's only a couple. I wanna ask you to endeavor with me to do something. I want you to have an out-of-body experience for a second. I know that's hard, but like, what are you talking about? What's this guy, where's this guy going with this? I want you to it, it, close your eyes for a second, and, and right before you watch this film, I want you to imagine that this person in this film is your brother, or your son, or your cousin. It's somebody very close to you. I want you to just imagine that and then just watch this film. Okay, and then we're gonna talk about reactions. Are we ready? The next one. Okay, what do I need to do? Do I need to do something? Huh? Oh, they're getting it? Should I keep going or? or? Yes, no, maybe. All right, so, so let, me, let me skip that and we'll come back to it if we can. I hope we can because it's, it's a really interesting exercise. Um, but when you, watch, when you watch and you empathize with other people, something comes up often and it's very prevalent in our country called unconscious bias. How many people have heard of unconscious bias? Oh, good, okay. Well, I don't need to go too far into that. But unconscious bias is around preconceived points of view that we may have or, or preconceived notions that we may have about other people. Um, and it's, and it really, you know, the term stereotypes, they're stereotypes, but they're, they're, they're stereotypes that actually influence our behavior and our thought processes. And they're also mechanisms for self-protection, sometimes very valid ones, sometimes completely invalid. But we do that in part to put up a shield to protect ourselves. So when your eyes see blank, you think, feel, and believe, and behave with blank. All right, you fill in the blanks. Now, I had an exercise where I did a session in Seattle, and I said, I want everybody in the room to close your eyes, and I want you to picture a homeless person. Now, by the way, I chaired the United Way board in Seattle, which is one of the three or four pillars of that organization is fighting homelessness, so I'm pretty up close and personal to the homelessness crisis in Seattle. I said, close your eyes, I want you to, and, and this was almost all Caucasian audience, I said, close your eyes, I want you to picture a homeless person. Open up their eyes. I said, now be honest with me. Ma'am, what, what, what was your homeless person? He said, it was a big black man who, you know, hadn't showered in a long time. Ma'am, what was your? It was a black man who, da, 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 da. what was yours? It was a, okay, so almost everybody in the room pictured a black man as a homeless person. And yet the majority of homeless people in Seattle are Caucasian. Now why is it that when you close your eyes and I ask you to picture a homeless man, you picture a black man, and if I ask you to picture a businessman, you picture Steven Spielberg or, you know, why, the, you know Zuckerberg or, the, you know, the, the head of IBM or whatever. Why, why is that? All right? And it's because of our biases that we have. It's not that there aren't successful African Americans or Latinos or Asians. It's that we have set ourselves to these certain images and approaches and stereotypes that are hard to break. Are you guys not able to do this over there? Carla, are you not able to do this? Huh? It's okay if you can't, just let me know, okay. Um, so I won't go through this, I'll just, I'll just really high level. This has significant impacts on people's lives and their work, right? So if your teachers, teachers telegraph prejudices and biases in ways that almost create two classrooms in one. Like you're almost teaching two different groups of people. One's getting this standard of education and the other one's getting a different standard in the same classroom which is remarkable, right? Two different educations, job interviewers, experiments with job interviewers that sit further back from African-American and Latino candidates, creating a gap, right? 25% um, of the interviews ended sooner, just cut off, like we're done, right? All of that leads to whether or not you actually get the job. And then women in math, and women sort of being told that, um, you know, reminded, your group is bad at math, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? So all these things are, are serious and significant outcomes. 
Um, so, so people ask, like, why, why, why can't we fix this? Why can't we go faster? You know, it turns out that changing unconscious biases and addressing issues of diversity is much harder than just continuing on the path that you're on, right? How many of you wake up every morning and say, I think I'm going to tackle issues of race today? Anybody? It's really hard, right? I think I'm going to go talk to my friends about unconscious bias and exclusionary practices that are happening here in Connecticut. Like, it's just not something that people do. And it's not indicting anybody. It's just we're on a certain pathway, right? It's also I, this issue that I call the self-fulfilling prophecy issue, which is like, you know, once you're in, pick a university for, as an example. If you went to a university and it was all one type of student, right, whether it's Caucasian, Asian, African American, and you try to turn the corner and you bring a student who's not from that group to the campus, what happens? That student gets to that campus and says, this isn't where I want to be. I don't want to be the only student of color on this campus or the only Caucasian student. I feel out of place. So that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and it's very hard to break. So these are reasons why this is hard. Um, our systems aren't set up for diversity. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with CEOs and they say, I want to be diverse. I want my company to be diverse. And you say, okay, well, let's go talk to your... HR department, you walk downstairs, and there's nobody of color in their HR department. And there's nobody of color on their recruiting team. And the firms that they use are not firms that recruit from black or Latino or Asian communities. And you say, well, how are you going to get to diversity with that? Right? You're fishing for an ocean fish in a pond. You'll never catch an ocean fish in a pond, no matter how hard you try. Right? So the systems aren't set up. And then I would say there's a lack of true organizational champions, which is to say people who care enough about this issue. You just turned off my screen. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get this video to work. You know, it's okay. We skipped the video at this point. Sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, we're, we're, we need to keep going. So video. Just everyone. Video. Video. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll show it. If we have time when, when Judy and I are talking, we'll, we'll show it. Okay. Um, so organizational champions are those who come into an organization and say, this matters to me. I get it. I'm going to push it. I'm going to pursue it. And, you know, I'm going to take some risks on that, right? Whether you're in a nonprofit, whether you're in a governmental entity, whether you're in a for-profit corporation. Um, so those people take some chances and some risks and push this as an agenda item. So people ask, why, why isn't, you know, we're not making progress fast enough. These are some of the reasons. They're, they're real reasons, and we have to acknowledge those. So what can be done? Let's, let's, let's close out on this, Judy, and then go into the next phase. So what can be done? So I have this thing where I say, you know what? If you're 19 years old or 20 or 40, and you've never experienced what it's like to be the only person in the room, go out and do that. Like if you're, if you're a black person and you've never been the only person in the room, I don't think there is one, by the way, not in this room. Because we're the only people in the room all the time. But how about being a Caucasian person, being the only person in the room full of black people? Have you ever done that? How about being a Caucasian person in the, as the only one in the room full of a room of Asians? Have you ever done that? Right? So the reason I say that is because if you haven't ever been the only person in the room, you have no idea what that feels like. You can't have empathy because you haven't experienced it. And trust me when I tell you, and if you don't believe me, ask some of your people of color classmates. It's a challenging thing to be the only one in the room, right? You have a much greater sense of empathy when you do it yourself and you go, yeah, that's hard. And, and so being the only person in the room is a, part, is a uh, big part of this. Um, reflect diversity in your own sphere of influence. Look, you don't, you don't have to try to change the world. You know, at Starbucks, we used to talk about changing the world one person, one cup, one neighborhood at a time, right? Making it personal. You all have a sphere of influence right now. How diverse is your sphere of influence? What are you doing to ensure you have different ideas and conversations happening in your sphere of influence right now? Not waiting till you get to some lofty post and saying, well, when I get there, you know, that's when I'm going to start living my life. You know, the life that you're living right now is not a dress rehearsal for life. This is it. 
Like you're living your life right now. All of us are. Influence your, your sphere to be more diverse. And then understand the difference between diversity and inclusion. Diversity says how many people are in my sphere of influence that don't look like me and don't think like me. Inclusion says I value their opinions and I'm not trying to make them conform to mine. I value their way of being and I'm not trying to turn them into me. Right? So I, I've dealt with a lot of colleges and universities and one of them, who shall remain nameless, did a great job of diversity. They brought students in from all over the place. But the inclusion part, when you sat down with those students and you had conversations with them, what they said was, I don't feel like I'm respected here. I don't feel like my background and culture is welcome. Everybody's trying to get me to conform to make me into something that I'm not, right? Inclusion is the, is the corollary, the important corollary to diversity. And then what, so then what can be done with organizations? You know, you all are gonna be running organizations, leading organizations. Success breeds success. That's kind of the antidote to what I said about the self-fulfilling prophecy. Success breeds success. The more people you bring in, the more people come in and see, the greater your success and it becomes a flywheel. Believe in the power of the collective IQ. That's tapping into an I. This is something I truly believe in. Like the power of this group or any group, of lar a large group of people, the more diverse it is, the, the higher the collective IQ, by the way. But the power of this group to solve a problem is better than, than the smartest person in the room. This group or any group will consistently solve problems better than the smartest person in the room, right? What that means when you think about it applied to diversity, it gets even stronger. The collective IQ gets even stronger, which is to say you want a diverse group of people with a collective IQ going after problems that we have to solve, like some of those big ones that we talked about. Never run away from who you are as a leader. If you're black, if you're Jewish, if you're Asian, if you're uh, uh, Latino, if you're gay, whoever you are, don't run away from who you are. Claim it. Claim it. Be proud of it. Engage. And, and try, to, try to help diversity and inclusion evolve around the space that you're a part of or that you care about. And then take any opportunity you can to lead on diversity. Not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because on a practical level it will be beneficial to you in your careers. And I love this quote from Maya Angelou and then I'm done. Um, it's time for parents to teach young people early on that in diversity there's beauty. There's a little typo there. In diversity there's beauty and there is strength. And so thank you guys for listening and I'm going to ask your esteemed president to join me on the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Um, you're inspiring, as always, as I know you are. And your life teaches us a lot. And I want to leave time for people to ask questions, also from New Haven, from uh, North Haven. And I think it's uh, hashtag Blair Taylor. And I have an iPad in front of me, and we'll do the 21st century thing. All right. And Good. ask questions that way. I'm actually going to be briefer in, in my questions because I want to give time for Q&A here. But you talked about uh, never running away from who you are as a leader. So I would love to know about the evolution of Blair Taylor as the agitator of change, and that's what I call Blair, really, um, as somebody who was never afraid to run into a wall to make things better for people. Um, was it, I mean, I know a little bit about your upbringing. Was it that you yourself experienced pain, threat, exclusion? Did you observe it in others or was there some epiphany where you saw that you had the power to, to change things? And I ask that because I think that each of us can find in our own lives a way to be agitators of change. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so first of all, I, I appreciate the question. I, I had great 
teachers and my two parents who uh, were fearless uh, in terms of going after injustices. And, um, and they, they had five boys and all my brothers are, my parents are still alive, all my brothers are still living. And they, I think they, 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 they made a point of saying, you're going to go after things that are not fair and not right, and you're not going to be afraid of failing. And I think it's that second part that has emboldened me in my life. Because if you're afraid of failing, you're paralyzed, all right? We're all gonna fail, all right? We're all gonna have hardships. I don't care who you are, how nice a person you are, how good you've done. You could be the best do-gooder ever in the history of the world, and you're gonna have setbacks. I had a pastor of a church who said to me once, you know, life only has three phases. You're either in a crisis, you're coming out of a crisis, or you're heading to a crisis, right? And, and he's, in many ways, that's right. Life is full of crises, right? It's not whether or not you have the crises or the setbacks, it's how you deal with them. It's when you get knocked down, do you get back up? Do you stay in the game? Do you persevere, right? And so part of this is, yes, I've run into walls. Um, I don't like particularly running into walls, but I've come to accept it. And I've also come to realize that, hey, there's not a wall that I've met in my lifetime that can't, you can't figure out a way to navigate, circumnavigate, or get through. Now, maybe sometimes it's not me. Maybe I have to hook up with somebody else or empower somebody else or delegate, right? Or bring a group together to solve the issue. But all of those issues that we put up on that board a few minutes ago, all of them are solvable, right? Every single one. But it's gonna take people who say, doggone it, we're gonna solve this and we're gonna persevere. And I think those are the qualities, uh, Judy, that have helped me in my journey. I, I heard a quote from someone who said that fear is more destructive than failure. Yes, I that think you that's right. Recover from failure. I think you, you do. You get knocked down, you get back up. But if you if you're totally fearful, you're paralyzed. I, when I'm building a team, I will look to people who not reckless abandon, not incredibly, you know, I'll run across the freeway at rush hour because I'm fearless. No, I don't, I don't want you on my team. You're going to do that. But I want people who are not afraid to take risks, who will push the envelope, who will push me and whatever organization to be the best that we can be. You know, the saddest thing you can say about somebody at the end of their life is not that they tried and failed. That's not the saddest thing, right? The saddest thing you can say about somebody at the end of their life is that they didn't hit their potential. Their God-given potential was not achieved. And so how do you get to your potential? it necessarily involves an iterative process of success and failure. Well, and I saw that, I mean, Don mentioned that I first got to know Blair when he was head of the Urban League in LA. And Los Angeles is a very complicated, difficult, divided city. And you can just curl up and say, it's impossible, we can't do anything. And Don brought together coalitions that would go into some of the most difficult life situations, community situations, and to say, we gotta start somewhere. Right. And you gotta start somewhere, right. and you did that. Absolutely, and, and, and again, you know, that, that comes back to you know, lead from where you are. Whether you're at the head of a big organization or whether you're a student at a university or whether you're, you know, my daughter is in 10th grade and she's trying to lead a coalition for the city of Seattle. And I told her, go for it, I'll support you in whatever way I can. And you know, you could say she's only in 10th grade, why is she doing that? Because she's leading from where she is, right? If you constantly view yourself as a leader, right, wherever you are, you, if you take that leadership responsibility seriously, then you recognize that I have a responsibility for forward motion. I have a responsibility for bringing other people along with me. I have a responsibility for contributing to society. It's not a nice to do, it's mandatory as leaders. So you, you, I, I want to turn to your four fantastic kids who uh, you moved to Seattle from Los Angeles when you took the Starbucks job. And, and you've told me that this was a difficult transition for them. This was a less diverse community. Yeah. Um, they noticed that, they experienced that. And um, sometimes they experienced difficulty. So what can we learn as parents, as teachers, as neighbors, from that experience on how to bring people who are different and new 
into our community to make them feel not just welcome, but that we feel that we are really enriched yeah. and more creative and better because of their presence. Yeah. So um, my kids are four of them, uh, ages 12 to, 20, to 21 now. Um, they are the most incredible human beings I've met as, and probably in this lifetime. They're wonderful people, they're kind-hearted, um, they're smart, they're resilient. They take after their mom and all those qualities, so you don't have to worry about any of them coming from dad. They all came from the other side of the family. Um, but they're really good human beings. And when we moved to Seattle, I watched them get hurt. Um, and you know part of the reason why they got hurt was not somebody coming up to them and calling them a racial name. That actually didn't happen. And by the way, some of the most insidious forms of racism today are the underground racism. You won't come up and tell me, you know, call me the N-word to my face. You'll go home and teach it to your children, right? And you'll, and you'll talk about how this hatred and vitriol, right? That's, to be honest with you, I'd almost rather somebody come up and call me that to my face. So at least I know who you are. I know how to identify you. I, you know, I can deal with that. If it goes underground the way it has in America in the last 30, 40 years, it's, it's, it's almost even more odious and, and insidious to me. And, and what, what happens in Seattle, as wonderful as the city can be, is there's, and this goes back to unconscious bias, there's, there's diminished expectations for African Americans. And my kids are off the charts smart. They take that after their mom, too. They're off the charts smart, like 99th percentile type of thing. And when they got to Seattle, the teachers, like I talk about teachers teaching two different classes, the teachers' expectations were, oh, you got a B minus? Good for you. That's great. My daughter's like, no, B minus isn't good. Well, you know, I'm an A student. I was, I was in an accelerated school in Los Angeles that was two grades ahead. That's a lousy grade. No, it's okay for you. You know, you don't have to worry. So the diminishing expectations really started to hurt their self-esteem. And when people keep diminishing your expectations, look, I found that if you set a high bar for people consistently, they will elevate to meet that bar. If you set a low bar for people consistently, they will fall to the lowest in the common denominator. But these were differential expectations, which is more than just setting a low bar. Right, right. You know, there's a, there's a, uh, a story, that a, a one-minute story that I'll tell about a guy who was walking down the street and he saw a flea circus. And he looked at these fleas, and he noticed that all these fleas were jumping to the exact same height in the sink. And he walked by, and he said to the guy who was behind the counter, he said, you know, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Everybody knows a flea can jump three or four feet. How in the world did you train those fleas to all jump to the exact same height like that? And, and by the way, there's no lid on your cage, so they, they easily could be jumping out. He said, they're not. They're jumping up to the exact same height. And the guy looked at him, he said, it's easy. When they're little tiny fleas, but when they're just babies, I put a lid on the cage, they jumped up, they hit the lid, they kept hitting the lid, kept hitting the lid, and finally they thought, that's the extent of my world. My world doesn't go any farther, so I took the lid off and they never jumped any higher than that. And that's what we're doing to many of our kids. It's not that they don't have the potential to leap out of the cage. We put a lid on them and they can't get out of that. And you know, that can scar you for life. We took a lot of work and effort to undo some of the things that were happening to our children. And, and, and as I said, the worst thing that can happen to you in life is you just don't hit your potential. Somebody puts a lid on your cage and therefore you don't jump as high as you can. And to me, as a parent, that's just flat out unacceptable. Flat out unacceptable. So this experience that you mentioned about your daughter brings up a, a difficult issue on campuses in particular these days and that's uh, this notion of safe spaces and, and trigger warnings. And there is, uh, there's quite a, a, a divisive discussion around, around the merits of, of that, trigger warnings and safe spaces, versus a school of thought. I, I think um, Jonathan Haidt is one of the most uh, vocal proponents of that, who just wrote a book called The Coddling of the American Mind. Um, who says that we're coddling our children, mm -hmm. we're not setting high enough expectations, and we're in fact limiting their experiences to the point that they don't develop emotional resilience, 
and they're not exposed to the diversity of ideas that they need to be exposed to to be living in an inclusive, broad, open-minded society. Right. Um, and, and you mentioned this notion that your daughter was effectively coddled by the teachers in saying, it's okay, dear. Yeah, you're doing B minus fine. is okay. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you know, people like Chris Rock won't appear on campuses today right. because um, he fears that what he says will be seen as unacceptable by the students yeah. for reasons of uh, safe spaces and trigger warnings. I'm gonna quote President Ruth Simmons of Brown when she was president of Brown. She says, learning is the antithesis of comfort. The collision of views and ideologies is in the DNA of the academic enterprise. We do not need any collision avoidance technology here. In other words, bring it on. So how, how do you weigh these considerations of universities as, as the town square, the marketplace of provocative ideas where you have to have invite discussion and sometimes uncomfortable discussion where creativity comes because of the no holds barred and still needing to be respectful and mindful of individuals, sometimes painful, threatening histories people really feeling because of their experiences of, of, of needing to be safe. So, so how do we so, deal with so that tension? So a couple of thoughts. So first of all, I, I welcome debate on any time. I love debating. I, I'm like, bring it on, let's have a debate for ideas and concepts and policies and positions. And it's a beautiful thing to me. And what I always try to do is put the idea out in front of you and attack the problem or the concept and not the person. So how do you put something out? And this, by the way, works in personal relationships too. When you're married, you put the problem out and you attack the problem and you don't attack the person, right? And, you, and therefore, you're both trying to solve the problem, maybe from different angles and perspectives. There is nothing wrong with the free-flowing discourse and exchange of diverse ideas. Whether you're left of center, right of center, doesn't matter. Where it falls apart is where either A, we start going after the individual, right, for believing whatever they believe, and B, it turns into violence and hostility. As soon as that happens, there's no place for that on the campus of a college. As soon as somebody has a history of promoting violence around their ideas, there's no place for that in college, in my opinion. But there short is a place, of that? But short of that, I, think there, I honestly think there is a place. If you're a liberal arts college with a liberal bent, you should be having conservatives come and talk on your campus and, and, and exchange their ideas and positions. Not because you're trying to convert people. You know, some of my strongest positions on what, whatever subject I've, I've articulated a position on, whether it's an op-ed, whether it's in speeches, some of those strongest positions have come from listening to somebody who has a different position and really understanding how to dissect and, and, and actually counteract their position, right? So you can actually strengthen your position by listening to others, without dogma, but with facts. And so I think that's a really important thing for colleges and universities to understand. Because the problem is when we start breathing in our own exhaust, right? we start surrounding ourselves with people who just believe what we do, who just say what I do, who believe like I do politically, who believe like I do socially. The problem is you're, you're missing that whole diversity of ideas, where the collective IQ of that diverse audience is bigger and stronger and the outcomes and the ability to build solutions is greater. So one last point, because I can't help, you know, people talking about being coddled, I have to tell a funny story. Michelle Ree, who uh, was the chancellor of DC public schools a few years back, came to Seattle. And she said, Blair, I want you to be the one who interviews me on the stage for my new book. And I said, great. So I'm on the stage with her, and we're talking about this notion of coddling young people. And she, she looks at me, and she's, and this is in front of 1,200 people in the audience. She goes, you know, Blair, um, if you walk into my kid's room uh, today and you look around their room, uh, you'll see trophies all over the place, giant trophies, like from the floor for tennis. It's like, you know, walking to one of my daughters, walking down, they see tennis. She goes, the problem is my daughters suck at tennis. Like, they're not good. She goes, but they got all these trophies for coming in seventh and eighth and ninth. They said, we're giving kids trophies for coming in seventh or eighth or ninth. Now, 
on the one hand, I know why people say that's not a bad thing because you're, you know, you don't want anybody to be a loser and all that kind of stuff. On the other hand, comma, the real world doesn't give you a trophy for coming in eighth place, okay? It just doesn't. And to, to think that it does is setting a whole series of expectations that when that young person gets out in the world, it's like, hey, I came in seventh place. And that, you know, your boss is like, and we lost the account because of that, you know? <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a quick clash of ideas and positions and perspectives. And so I don't think we're doing a service to our young people today when, we, when we're that insular. Um, and I understand some of the reasons behind it, but I think we have to let them experiment, let them take risks as well. And I'd like to think that at Quinnipiac, we can handle the uncomfortable while also finding forums where we support individuals who need that support uh, privately or in frank discussions. Yeah. But I, I, I hope that we are open enough to be able to accommodate views that are not familiar not or your, not comfortable. Not necessarily your own, right? So now it's your turn, please. Um, there are microphones here. I can go first to the iPad if, if people are thinking of asking a question. Is there a question? Go yes. ahead. And there's um, a microphone, or I can repeat it. I know there are microphones around yeah, the room. She's got a mic. Oh, you have a mic. OK, yeah. good. Allison, do you mind telling us if you're what year and? Oh yeah, I am a senior, uh, finance major. Um, I'm on student government here at Quinnipiac, and that's kind of where my question would be. Um, the student government has had problems in the past with building a diverse group, and that's been a really difficult workplace. And I've seen it at my internship. Um, I've seen it at my internships um, in higher education, et cetera, et cetera. And you talked about how we need to break down those barriers. I'm just wondering how um, we've been constantly working on student government about breaking down those barriers, building diversity within our organization, uh, building a separate position, a multicultural leadership program, and more. But how do we make someone feel comfortable coming into a room where they're maybe you know, in the minority. So is that because the students that you're seeking aren't there in numbers, or is that because they're not participating? Because those are two different problems. You see what I'm asking? In other words, are you, are you trying to get students into student government when there just aren't a lot of students to get into student government, or are you trying to get students into student government and they're just not participating, but they're there? I think it's um, when you have a room of 42 people and 40 of them are Caucasian, it's um, making someone feel like they can enter into that room. Yeah, yeah. So this is a, you know, this is a great question. I appreciate the question. Thank you for asking it. You know, the, the only way you break down those barriers, in my opinion, is you literally go out and get three or four people and invite them into the room in a group, not one person. Because remember I talked about the fact that if, if you're a single person, it actually can create that feeling of I'm ostracized, I'm all by myself, and I don't want to be the sole representative for Latinos in this room. I need their security in some numbers. So even if it's not, they have a, there's a formal role, invite them into the room, let them see. Some of this is about demystification, right? You know, I always say as a leader, my job as a leader is not to make myself mysterious. It's quite the opposite. It's to make my life open and achievable for anybody who wants to achieve it. You know, I've met with the President of the United States and he puts his pants on one leg at a time, right? And, and you know, the, the big eye-opening thing for me was recognizing that, you know, hey, this guy's, you know, he's a smart guy and everything. He's Barack Obama, he's a good guy, he's good-hearted. But I know 50 people out there who are just as smart, just as capable, just as talented, right? So your role as a leader is to demystify what's happening in that room and bring in a group of people who don't feel threatened because they're the only one in the room, which can happen, and that's why I talked about it. it's, it's good for all of us to have that experience, right? But they, they now understand, oh, I can have a voice here. Oh, they're talking about issues that matter to me. Oh, this might be something I want to plug into. And then give them a pathway to participate. And I think the evidence, um, at least on the gender front, shows that 
there is a disruptive leap in terms of the effectiveness and the sense of power of women in groups when you go beyond the token, the token of one or two. So critical Absolutely. mass, and I, I don't, don't know if this applies to individuals of different ethnic backgrounds, but for women, the data clearly show that going beyond a critical mass is very empowering. So don't have student teams, learning teams, work teams that have just onesies or twosies. Um, one, a question over here, please. And please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Nick, a political science and economics major. Blair, we spoke earlier, if you recall. Yes, all. I do. Um, and my question is, how can we influence diversity within an organization while being external of it? So you're not in the organization. What's your role? I'm you're, just speaking You're broadly. saying an, or, society, an organization that you aren't a participant in. Is that what, am I understanding the question correctly? Yes. And how can you influence that? Yes, how can we bring more diversity into an organization while not being within it? From the outside. Yes, exactly. Well, you know, Thanks, Nick. I, 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 again, uh, good question. Um, it's, it's always harder to effectuate change from the outside, but you, you gotta first, you know, raise your hand and engage, right? And all too often people, you know, Howard Schultz used to have a, a, a statement that he would say to me and Howard other. Schultz was Howard Sch CEO of Starbucks. Okay, now. how many people know Howard Schultz in the room? Anybody? Okay. okay, so about a third. Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks, uh, <laughs> maybe running for president. Howard, I'm not announcing anything. That's up to you. But he's, he said he may be running for president of the United States. And um, uh, he was an uh, you know, incredible leader at Starbucks. And one of the things he used to say is, don't be a bystander. Like, don't be a bystander in life. Like, engage in some way, right? So even if you're not an insider, if you will, you know, if you're willing to engage from the outside and push something, I, I have to tell you a really quick story. The way that I got into Starbucks was I actually wrote a letter to Howard Schultz when I was CEO of the Urban League criticizing Starbucks for its lack of engagement with communities. Howard Schultz called me up, said, I got your letter. It was very thought-provoking. Why don't you come up and see me? I flew up, had a conversation with him ended up in him investing significant dollars in revitalizing, revitalizing South Los Angeles. Over a couple of years, got to know him, and then he, and he made me a job offer, right? All from a letter from an outsider who wasn't an insider in Starbucks at that time, but many of the things and ideas that I gave him, he started to implement even when I was an outsider. And by the way, letter writing works for anybody who's wondering about and a, it. And a great career tip I, here. I, I'm serious, it works. I can tell you story after story after story. And so just make sure that you're engaged on the things that you care about. And even if you're not in the organization or agency, thoughtfully engage that agency, thoughtfully. Not with a stick coming in and beating them over the head. Nobody likes that, right? I didn't go in and tell Howard Schultz, you know, this is, you're dead wrong, you're terrible. I went in and said, here's the things that you're not doing the way that you might. And by the way, I want to help you to figure out how to do them better. Well, people welcome you in the room with that conversation, right? I'm going to ask a, a tough question that was asked here, and I'm going to read it verbatim uh, from, um, from somebody who used the hashtag. And that is, and, and I want us to be able to confront sometimes tough and uncomfortable questions. How do you respond to people who say that the emphasis on diversity erases white people or devalues their contributions? Is racist to white people? Er erases. Or, oh, erases, erases white people. People's contributions. Um, you know, I think, I think there's, a, uh, there's this sort of reverse racism thing that's going on uh, in America, and it's been there for a long time, like this notion that like diversity somehow means excluding someone else. Um, my definition, and I think, I, I don't mean to be dogmatic, but I think the right definition of diversity is including as many groups as humanly possible. And it's not excluding somebody, whether they're Caucasian or happen to be African American or Latino, it's actually welcoming people to the table. And in that process, you're recognizing that certain groups may not have been welcome at that table for a long time. And therefore, it's really important to, to take action to make sure that they are at the table. It's not saying that some other group has to be pushed away from the table. And so 
you know, this notion of a zero-sum game in this country is really troubling because it's not a zero-sum game. We can grow the pie. We can't. Zero-sum game means if I win, you necessarily lose. If you win, I lose, right? And that's the way we've operated. We don't have to have poverty in America. I reject the premise. We don't have to have people who could go to college, who have the potential, who aren't going. I reject the premise, right? Grow the pie. We certainly can do it through online education and get more people a college degree who want them, who, who have the ability, right? We can change the paradigms on poverty if we want to, right? So I think first you have to lose that mindset that somehow you win, I lose, your kids win, my kids lose, therefore it must be reverse racism. No, actually, it's how do we build the best mousetrap for this country and the best future for America? And we need to do that by tapping into our greatest strength, which is our diversity. Thank you, and I'm gonna give you the last question. Um, and, and again, um, this has been a very insightful, inspiring dialogue. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christina. I'm a senior computer information systems major. Um, I wrote my question here, but it was, uh, what's your opinion on women in STEM? And do you think it's becoming more diverse? And if not, how do you think it can get even better? Women in STEM? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's my opinion on women in STEM? We've got a long way to go. Uh, we've got you have a, a daughter who's a woman I've, in STEM. I've got a daughter who is an incredible um, STEM young lady. She's graduating from UCLA, uh, pre-med at UCLA. Um, I've got another child, son, who's really interested in STEM. Um, but you know, the, the barriers for women uh, to get into the STEM area is no different than the other barriers that we've talked about tonight. I mean, there are walls and barriers that are preventing women from accessing and playing in that game. And it's to the detriment of those industries. I mean, make no mistake about it, you know, if you're a young lady who's an engineer, finding a mentor that's a woman is hard, right? And yet, you need a mentor. Right? There's nothing that you will do in life that you will ever do by yourself. Right? And I always say, if you are able to surround yourself with great greatness, surround yourself with people who are going somewhere, they will take you with them by almost by inertia. Like they'll just, you know, I always tell my kids, like, if you ever look around and you, you look at your friend group and you go knucklehead, 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 you know, the next finger should be like knucklehead, right? Because you surrounded yourself with mediocrity. You want to surround yourself with greatness and people who are going somewhere. And, and you know, when you look around in certain industries and there are not a lot of choices, right? Because I've had people speak truth to power in my life, which is the reason I'm sitting here, right? And you look around and you, and you can't find too many choices. It makes it that much harder. So huge problem. I wish, you know, we had another three hours to try to talk about it and tease out an answer. We don't. But needless to say, if that's where you want to go, try to find anyone. I mean, it doesn't have to be a female, a woman, but try to find anyone you can who's going to support you in that journey, who's going to believe in the vision for your life, and latch on to that person or persons. And, and believe in yourself. And believe in yourself. Yeah. Madam President, if you don't mind, if I have the last question, please. It's, if I you do it quickly. Important. I apologize. I didn't realize you were shutting down. Um, and this is important because of uh, uh, this issue. Um, my question is, um, and uh, you being someone who's, who's obviously had some great experience at, at the Obama administration working with corporations, how do we get the uh, corporations in this country, uh, maybe some of the agencies that have the resources and power to really look deeply at the issues plaguing young black and Latino males in this country? It's an urgent issue with the school to prison pipeline is real. Um, and I don't think that at this point we have really put a focus on that. And when we look around rooms like this and we see the limited amount of African-American and Latino males um, and we don't see the seriousness of what's happening, it, it's very concerning. And I think that in early, at an early age, if we can get those companies and corporations and institutions to really focus and come together with a think tank, um, I mean, I would think that would solve it. How do we do that? How do we get yeah. them? So, so I appreciate the question, and I don't, I don't pretend to have the right answer, but I'll tell you what my approach has been. My approach has been in my career to try to establish win-wins. So 
when I approach a corporation to be involved in community, whether as a CEO of the Urban League or as somebody who's building a coalition of companies to attack a problem, I don't appeal to altruism. I appeal to what drives that company. So when we built the 100,000 Opportunities Initiative, an initiative which, as Don said, has now hired a coalition of 50 companies, which I recruited many of those companies when I was at Starbucks, most of them actually, those 50 companies have now hired more than 200,000 disengaged youth, giving them jobs, opportunities, medical benefits, promotion opportunities, et cetera. And the, the sales pitch to each one of those companies wasn't, oh, can you come over here and help these poor kids in the community who don't have a job? The sales pitch to those companies was, we have a 3.7% unemployment rate, you can't find talent to fill your jobs. I got a pool of people here in cities who are often facing 35% unemployment rates. They've got incredible skills, incredible talents. They're untapped. They're not hitting their potential. Why don't you come in and hire them? And oh, by the way, when you do, they'll run through walls for you because a job for them is not a transactional situation. It's a life-changing experience. I didn't work because I needed a couple extra bucks. This kid works because he has to support his family or she has a single mom in the house who needs the income. So a job to them is, is a, is a life-changing experience. And so therefore, they stay longer, they work harder, companies coming back and saying it's the fastest promotional cohort I've ever had. Like, the talent was there, the companies didn't know how to tap it. When you showed them how to tap it, there was an ROI, a return on investment for the companies, the community wins, the young people win, the companies win. The more of those scenarios that we can set up, and there are dozens of ideas around that, and the less that we appeal to the just do it because it's the right thing. Business is in business to make money. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not the cardinal sin, okay? Making money, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with capitalism. Runaway capitalism, where people don't care about anything else but making money, I understand, right? But the notion of making money in capitalism, there is a way of dovetailing that back to driving community change and effectuating change that's positive for the community. And we got to figure out how to tap those things to bring the corporations in. And involve thank the institutions. you. Thank you, yes. Madam President. And I want to thank Blair. Um, you've, you've given us that extra set of reasons and, and, and values and reinforced what we believe uh, the second pillar of our strategic plan is around inclusive excellence. We firmly believe in expanding the pie, making us a better institution because we have the celebration of riches, of differences, which makes us a more creative, Absolutely. a stronger, and, and um, a help in the community pipeline. So uh, thank you for making sure that we thank continue you. down that path. We have a blue box there for you, which I blue promise box. you. Yeah, that blue like, box. Um, and we'll send like that. Like let's to make a deal or price is right. <laughs> and I want to thank everyone for your participation and for the folks that wrote in too. And sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions. Thank you, Judy. Have a thank great you all. Evening. You guys are wonderful. Appreciate it.